Hej. Hej. Sorry. So, hello. Um, thank you for having us here. We're really pleased to be here. Really happy to be here. Um, we're made in Gruppe Bitnik from Zurich. My name is Carmen. This is Doma. Hi. And we're an artist group who works in and on the internet. And we would like to... Um, show you two, maybe three of our latest works. Uh, it, we're going to try to stop before football starts. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we'll start right away with a work called uh, Delivery for Mr. Assange. Okay. 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 Um, Our starting point for this work was our interest in the circumstances under which Julian Assange has been living since seeking asylum at the Ecuadorian Embassy in London in June 2012. So the embassy has been surrounded by British police uh, since August 2012. And I, I don't know if you know the situation. The embassy, uh, the Ecuadorian embassy in, is in the heart of London behind Harrods. So Uh, you practically walk out of um, the tube station through like tourists and shoppers and you're, you, you stand in this war zone outside the Ecuadorian embassy. So you have the Ecuadorian embassy surrounded by British police and... Um, yeah, there were like strange vans standing around with, uh, I don't know, strange antennas where you f just felt like surveilled also. Mm -hmm. And um, we, I mean, for us as artists, it's always important to find images for uh, what's going on around us, for our realities. And we found that this embassy, this surrounded embassy in a Western European uh, capital um, was a really um, good image for what's been going on uh, on the internet between... Um, people trying to make information free and people trying to keep it contained. And we asked ourselves, how can we intervene into this geopolitical stalemate? Because um, for us, it's often about uh, involving ourselves in situations we find that surround us. How can we sort of... Um, do something yeah. to this extraordinary yeah, situation. Maybe also with the tools we have, like we use computers, we have the internet, there's live cameras. Um, is there something we can, I don't know, like, is there, can we play with this situation? Or can we introduce a bit of normality? And we um, quickly came across a, a system that was still working quite normally, uh, which was uh, the postal system. And we asked ourselves, um, is it possible to send Julian Assange a letter? Um, so you know, will it arrive or would that be taken out of this system? I mean, like we knew it was before Snowden and we knew that even, I mean, like if we try to reach somebody in the embassy uh, from Zurich via email, that this mail, I mean, like they, they would read it, you know, every border they, it would cross. Uh, the mail would have been read, because if it's unencrypted, it's just like an open postcard. So we thought, okay, I mean, like, there is like some postal secrecy. We, we know that in our, uh, uh, in the post system, postal system. So why don't use the analog things and see, I mean, like, uh, okay, if, if you send something to Julian Assange, what route would it take? Would they open it? who would open it, uh, how long would it take, just like something like a trace route we, uh, command we have on Linux or a ping. Or, yeah, system test a in system a certain test, yeah. sense. And um, so we decided to um, send Julian Assange a parcel uh, with a hole in it because with the letter we wouldn't have known what was happening to the letter. So we built this parcel uh, inside it, there was a camera, which 
sort of took pictures out through that hole you see every 15 seconds and uploaded the images to the internet live. So we had this feedback channel from our parcel as it moved through the postal system. Yeah, and we, um, um, yeah, we went to London, uh, went to East London, and uh, uh, the Ecuadorian embassy is somehow in Western London, maybe. And uh, um, what we really like is like to create situations which we don't control. So like here, you drop off this parcel, you have a feedback channel, you have a live stream of it going through a system. It produces images of maybe an unknown territory also. And, uh, but you have no control over it. So it's us, we know exactly as much as, our, um, as the people watching at home, maybe, or watching the live feed. So yeah, we basically addressed the parcel to the Ecuadorian embassy and uh, dropped it off at the post office. So uh, this was um, the scan of the parcel, so you see more or less um, there's a, so the, a camera, a mobile phone, <laughs> because it, I mean, it's the easiest way to have a camera and a device which can also send the picture somewhere. Then you have a lot of batteries and some... So basically the, 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 the box was empty. It was just like a, a, the, the, the medium was the message. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, this is wrong. So, just a second. Um, so, we... Yeah. Hoppa. Sorry. So Dorma went to drop off the parcel at the post office. Um, maybe we'll see the images in a minute. So this was the website, and you had like the live images arriving here. And then um, because we wanted people also to be able to uh, understand what was going on if they hadn't watched it from the beginning. We um, took images we liked from this stream of images coming in and sort of um, uh, posted them on Twitter. So the, the comment you see at the bottom is, is the tweet. And uh, sort of tried to tell is the story, maybe me. Is that better? Yeah. And... Um, so you see, in the mirror, you see Doma queuing up. That's here, really small. Sort of a, an artist's self-portrait. And... Um, yeah, it's 12 o'clock uh, in the afternoon. Uh, 12 o'clock, I'm, I'm like midday. And uh, we're just like dropping it off. And I'm like, the first question was, I'm like, would they take it? You know, because it has this hole, it's, there's like elect electronic uh, devices inside, which are running. Uh, it was addressed to, to Julian Assange. It really felt like a uh, kind of, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, so here, getting closer to the counter. That's Doma. It was January, so cold. So the parcel was immediately accepted. Postal worker. And it would disappear in a reddish bag. So... Yeah, you'll and see. I mean, like, we didn't know what to expect, what kind of pictures to expect, but this was our reality for the next 40 hours, basically. Reddish pictures, really abstract paintings of reality. After an hour, some, nothing changed. We are in a postal bag, it's red. Some li a little bit of light. At three o'clock, two hours later, three hours later, a little bit more light. And at around four o'clock, we totally lost connection mm -hmm. to the camera. It was off for an hour. Um, and we didn't know, I mean, like, you know, what's happening. It's, I mean, like, our, our stuff we build is normally fragile. So it's, it's really, you know, it's not well tested. We, we tested in our, we tested in our studio, but uh, I mean, like, uh, you know, things can break. So um, we were kind of uh, unsure if the camera was broken or the internet connection was gone or if some, maybe somebody has opened the parcel and, you know, uh, just like has taken the device off. But after an hour, uh, we saw that the GPS started to move. So we also had like a GPS feedback, but not a live map, just like coordinates. And we saw that uh, it's heading 
like Eastern. Hmm? So um, at around six, we got readings from um, the uh, central London, I think it's called the Mount Pleasant Mail Centre. And uh, we were really excited. <laughs> so because after eight and hours, we got like the first picture from a postal system, which is... Uh, mm. And by this time, there were quite a few people following this on Twitter and on the website. Um, so we did this um, basically starting out with an empty Twitter account. And we really weren't sure if anyone was going to be interested in this experiment except for us. And um, so people also um, started to participate in the sense that they would tell us, um, you know, this post office is called Mount Pleasant. I know this because, um, I don't know, I've worked at the post office or um, I just know the postal system. And that was really interesting for us to have this channel um, through Twitter, to have this channel, uh, which also gave us a, a certain amount of feedback Lags, people walking, still at the Mount Pleasant office. It's nine o'clock. We are still like uh, in the center. Uh, we are pretty center, central in London, and uh, we are changing bags. So we were in a red bag, and now we are in a green bag. Greenish lights, pictures, bit of light. Packet is moving. So we are now uh, near King's Cross Station, which is uh, really central. So uh, if Eastern London, Western London, we are going in the direction of, of the embassy. Mm. Um, around this time, our servers actually started to crash from the amount of people uh, trying to watch. So we weren't very prepared for this. And people started to set up mirrors and uh, sort of um, run backup scripts, um, scraping the images because they were afraid... Um, we'll maybe uh, lose them the, or...? Yeah, the piece would go offline. And we were moving out of the city really fast now, according to the GPS readings. Um, and arrived uh, near Heathrow Airport at uh, Seva Lo Logistics, uh, sort of a Royal Mail um, sorting office. So most of the images were black, and uh, then we were like in a sorting area again. And so here we got, um, so the, the parcel was taken out of the bag again, um, we, we called this uh, unmanned photography. It sort of felt like um, this, this uh, parcel was actually alive and being like sort of being pushed through the system. It sort of um, felt like it had a life of, of its own and a view it shared with us. Yes, and uh, now it's already four o'clock in the morning. We are uh, traveling since uh, more than 12 hours and uh, we're heading back into the city. It was kind of strange because we made a, a, a small loop, I mean like a detour. a detour. So we went from East London 30 kilometers out of town and heading and are now in the morning heading back uh, uh, towards uh, Western uh, uh, London where uh, Julian Assange is based. So... Uh, at six o'clock in the morning, another um, <coughs> office. And um, yeah, um, we um, we're back in the city now. Um, actually, quite near the Ecuadorian embassy. And our movement was really like stop and go. So we had like the feeling that it's nine o'clock in the morning. We must be really near now. And uh, uh, we're maybe one kilometer away from the, from the embassy, but uh, another postal center nearby. It's 10 o'clock in the morning. So and around this time, uh, the BBC started 
to write about the piece. Um, so uh, the piece went online on BBC and our server went offline. Luckily, there were um, other servers to back it up, but it was really sort of hard to perform this piece and at the same time try to sort of run the infrastructure. And people um, online were starting to complain, going, um, hey, why is this still not delivered? Um, hey, Bitnik, I really need to get some work done. When do you think this parcel will be delivered? And uh, Hey, no one is working at our office. I've been watching this for 24 hours. I'm exhausted. This is more exciting than the mouse rover. Or, um, I mean, like, mostly black images. And you would say a black rectangle with life written in the corner of it has never been uh, so interesting. So the life uh, image had a life sign uh, in the corner. Mm. What I've learned from Bitnik, Parcel spent most, uh, spent a lot of time in complete darkness. So at around 11, I think we had the feeling that we are just like in front of the, um, the embassy and uh, now it was kind of, you know, a, 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 a really tricky situation. I'm like, would it pass the police barrier? How would they uh, deal with it? Um, how would the embassy deal with it? Because it's something like a, a, life run, a live camera inside uh, an embassy is always problematic. Sure, and in this yeah. case, uh, it's m maybe more problematic. So... And uh, so here we, we weren't sure, we sort of thought we must be in a van and uh, here we got proof. Um, so sometimes when the door would be opened and uh, other mail would be delivered, we sort of got a view of the outside and uh, we were getting really excited. Uh, there were people on Twitter going, can't somebody go and take a picture of this van? You know, what's happening? nearly empty, so we're maybe the last thing in this van. And we are, you know, really in the front of this uh, embassy. And then at almost two o'clock, this pick, and it looked like maybe a dump on the camera. Mm. And, then and this looked like flooring inside. Then this, I don't know if you see it really well, but uh, like, uh, it looks like a delivery folder, a delivery list or something. So we think we are in front of the embassy now, image is black, what's happening, nobody knows. Still black, same location, diplomatic crisis, lunch break maybe. And... Uh, oh, you can hardly see that. You can hardly see that, but here, uh, we have some kind of evidence of something which might be wood and maybe a floor. Mm. Uh, so yeah, you can see, we sort of, we basically got excited every time we could, we could <laughs> make out anything on these images. All dark again as somebody come out, covered the hole. So now like the GPS location would really say, I'm mean, like the same address as, as the embassies. Camera has been uh, transmitting images uh, from from this, from this, from the embassy, basically, since 30 minutes. Minutes. All images are black. We assume the parcel has been delivered to embassy, so we thought maybe we're inside now, but everything is black, so we are waiting, waiting, and then we got this tweet by WikiLeaks: "Hey, Bitnik, the package has arrived, and it's now with embassy security." So it was clear. Okay, wow, uh, we made it inside. Uh, now somebody needs to decide what's happening with it. Royal Mail has uh, delivered, WikiLeaks confirms, parcel uh, still sitting in total blackness, nothing's happening. The parcel camera transmitted over 9,000 images, most of them are black. Uh, we are referring to an internet meme. Uh, people immediately would respond that uh, it's not true, that there are only, uh, I don't know, 6,455 images black and the rest was colored. So people wrote software to analyze the blackness of the images and to analyze the uh, differences uh, inside the images. So they, you know, really had all the data uh, we didn't have at this time. 
So the parcel, uh, it's already four o'clock in the, in, the, in, in the afternoon. So since, I don't know, since eight o'clock in the morning, we thought, I'm like, we are just going to be there. The performance is going to end. But uh, yeah, we're almost waiting a whole, uh, another working day uh, in front of this, in front of our screens. Uh, uh, yeah. So uh, there was a little bit of drama with the battery packs which were inside. Parcel camera has been online for 24, five hours now. We estimate that the batteries will last another six. And then some light, you can see that. Gone dark again, and some light again at four o'clock. Here, strange. Battery state is critical, maybe a sofa, black, and then this. So this was like the first image we got of, we didn't know, we thought maybe the, um, the inside of the embassy immediately, uh, there were people on Twitter saying they have been to this embassy and they knew uh, this was like um, a sort of a waiting room, and, um, so, and it was so just something like, was happening. Yeah, it was just like some frames, and then it went black again. And yeah, it felt like that we have been alone in a room for some hours, and somebody maybe came in, just like uh, switched on the lights, and switched it off again. And yeah, six, six o'clock, nobody knows what's happening. Some movement, then... Uh, more images with color. Maybe somebody standing in front. It looks like a bone, it says here. Something fluffy. Maybe a cloud. And then this. I would say it's a dog. Is it an image or is it real? Or it might be a cat. The internet was like, hey, it's a... It's a cat. It's a cat. And we're, we're like, like, oh, it looks like a dog. Has Julian Assange taken over, maybe? Is somebody playing with us? And then this. Is this thing on? Was clear. Okay, wow. Uh, yes. Back to black. A tiger. Hello, world. Don't think we have to explain that to you here. Um, was clear. Julian Assange is performing in the embassy. It's live with a cow. And he's basically welcoming us to, uh, to Ecuador. Postal out is contagious. Image of a lion. Welcome to Ecuador. Tiger with a green um, something. Welcome to Ecuador. And then uh, to go a while. And then he would... Uh, he um, performed... Um uh, his solidarity with uh, people uh, in similar situations uh, yeah. than him. Justice um, for Aaron Swartz. Aaron Swartz had um, just, just passed uh, away two weeks before. Two weeks earlier, committed suicide. Free Bradley Manning, now known as Chelsea Manning. Free Nabil Rajab, which is a Bahrain, uh, Bahrainian, Bahrainian human activist. rights activist. Free Anakata. Free Jeremy Hammond, Free Rudolf Elmer, which is a Swiss whistleblower, uh, Free Anons, Justice for Aaron Swartz, um, Transparency for the State, Privacy for the Rest of Us. This was maybe the most uh, shared image, which mm -hmm. there are like still stickers around of it. Uh, Post Lot is Contagious, thank you Ecuador, thank you to all our supporters, keep fighting, 2013 will win, uh, out of cards. Yeah. And uh, this is it. And back to black. <laughs> so, uh, this was like a 36 hours journey. Um, so you see that we li like to work with uh, physical objects which are being uh, sent around, but also like with live online performances. And uh, we're really interested also in where this I mean, if you can still call it separate names, this online and offline comes together. And uh, 
For the next work uh, in 2014, we sort of felt we needed to reassess the internet from an artistic point of view because um, the internet is our, you could say, our artistic heimat, our home. And uh, with the Snowden revelations, it became clear that it was actually um, not what we thought it was. It was just uh, a tool for mass surveillance. And we sort of felt um, we really, like, for, out of a per very personal need, needed to um, look at um, this media again and try to find out um, um, how to how to deal with, um, with this um, mass surveillance. For a while we said we were producing art under mass surveillance. This sort of, we tried to react to this. And um, we became really interested in um, a parallel world or a part of the internet which... Um, the internet subculture. Has to do with internet subculture, the, the deep webs, because... Um, because of their encrypted and anonymous nature, they sort of hold um, other potentials for communication and sort of work differently than the surface webs. And we felt so, that we needed to um, visit these yeah, deep webs and do that with other artists, get other artists to help us uh, go on an exploration. So basically we teamed up with Digital Brainstorming, which, was, which is a Swiss cultural institution, and. Um, uh, Giovanni Carmine from Kunsthalle St. Gallen, which had an exhibition space, and we said, okay, let's, let's just look into those topics, let's see how artists work with the dark net, with the dark nets, with the deep webs, with the topics which are kind of uh, around. Maybe there's also like, a, we find traces in art history, and uh, we'll, we'll produce something, and it will be something which is really... Uh, you know, uh, which is an exploration. So the title was The Dark Net from Memes to Onion Land, an exploration. And uh, uh, it, it was an ex exhibition that ran from October to January this year. So oct October last year to January this year. And we, we had like uh, 12 artists participating. And most of the art pieces would deal with topics like identity, anonymity, disappearing, memes, the questions of trusts. Uh, th things like that. Yeah. Um, so, this was, um, we're going to take you through the exhibition really quickly. Um, sorry for this. Uh, for what? For doing it quickly, because all these works oh. deserve uh, a, a much longer look. Um, this is a work by Valentina Tanni. She's an Italian curator. The work is called The Great Wall of Memes. So she basically collects memes uh, she finds online, uh, most of them on 4chan, I guess, and she collects them. She's really interested in grouping them. You can see that here a bit, I guess. Um, so she's very interested in generations of memes, and of course this for, for an art space is very, uh, very important work because it talks of collective author authorship or... Or maybe also contemporary image production, yeah, exactly. that you have like uh, more than uh, one author working on something and which is produced really fast and, uh, and have like this, has like this life character nowadays. Mm -hmm. uh, we had uh, Simon Denny in the exhibition um, uh, with a work which deals uh, with this figure of uh, Kim.com, basically. And Founder of Mega Upload and Mega Video, I think the other website was called. So basically, he, he showed, uh, like in several uh, installations, uh, he, he shows all the uh, confiscated objects uh, from Kim.com, which were confiscated during a raid uh, in New Zealand, I think, two years ago. And the work deals with, um, how should I say, maybe it deals with this two poles of having all these free online services like Mega Upload where they lure you as a user to participate and everything is free and at the same time there's somebody, there's so much wealth production and there's somebody who, who, who owns so much so uh, this, the list of confiscated I items uh, has like, I don't know, dozens of bank accounts, dozens of cars, uh, yeah, and it deals with, with, those, with, 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 with those things. 
Um, there was also an uh, work in the exhibition by Hito Steil, a German filmmaker, uh, called Strike, uh, where she basically um, strikes the screen with a chisel and sort of um, talks of this, um, I don't know, the materiality of the screen and going beyond or into the screen, which we thought was very fitting with the exhibition. This is uh, Seth Price, an um, artist based in New York, uh, who um, let us reproduce uh, work he... Or a book also, which is sold out. Yeah, I think he produced a few years ago called How to Disappear in America, um, which is or sort of t alludes to these 1960s counter-cultural handbooks providing instructions for dropping out of the mainstream or dropping off the grid. And um, this book he put together um, from content which he found online explaining how to delete your current identity and form a new one. Um, uh, we had something from Anonymous also. Uh, this is a, a screenshot basically from the image board 4chan where um, uh, a user said, uh, or uh, an anonymous user said, this, uh, wrote this post, which says, art used to be something cherished. Now, literally, anything could be art. This post is art. And... Yeah, well, somebody put the screenshot up uh, for auction on eBay in July 2014. And on the 1st of August 2014, it sold for 90900 US dollars. So the art world went crazy. So, I'm like, there's yeah. this anonymous piece, which is. Um, so, but you weren't really sure if this. Uh, you know, is, is it a performance for eBay or is it, is it real? Are those bidders real? But uh, whatever it was, it was like a performative act, and uh, you know, somebody had to react on it, or the public, mm. publics reacted to it. So we actually contacted the person who put this up on eBay. Um, and uh, asked for permission to show this. Yeah, and in it was kind of funny because when we, s I mean, like the museum wrote him an official, uh, like, invitation yeah, request, yeah. Uh, letter, and, uh, and he wasn't sure if he should, you know, uh, claim authorship at the same time. I mean, like, he said this is a piece by Anonymous, but then, you know, when it had. You know, when it entered the art system, he was like, okay, maybe I should take my name, and we were discussing that, and in the end we cons convinced him uh, that the author of this piece should maybe stay anonymous. Well, yeah. sure. Do you want... Yeah. No. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, th this was also um, an art piece by Anonymous. It's called just I'll Be th There in 30 oh, Minutes. Sorry, I'm maybe like... it won't work. Yeah. Well, anyway, I can tell you about it. Um, it's, a, it's a meme, and it's uh, what w in, in the art world you would call a performance work for a now defunct specific webcam um, on Times Square in New York. So there was a webcam outside the souvenir shop um, which showed um, a New York card stand, you know, a card stand with New York postcards. And um, then there was a post on 4chan where somebody said, I'll, I'll be there in 30 minutes, you know, in front of this webcam, you can all watch, and I'll pull down this card stand. And this happened a number of times on 4chan. It was a recurring meme. But at the same time, of course, it happened, did not happen uh, many times also. So... This, this, I'll be there in 30 minutes, also became this uh, promise of, you know, eternity. <laughs> you know, watch New Yorkers uh, walk through or across Times Square. And we reenacted re the piece, so we had a card stand in, in the lot, uh, sort of the entrance of the exhibition space. And it was really pulled down twice. Uh, by people who... By people who, we don't know by whom, but uh, who obviously knew the meme. And, yeah. So the next piece is by Heath Bunting, which is, uh, which is a really interesting piece. So um, it's called The Status Project, and you should, uh, I think, check it out uh, online. 
and uh, uh, it deals with uh, identities and identities viewed from database systems, basically. So uh, he's punting what, what he does, he's collecting, since 10 years he's collecting identicatoren. Uh, uh, yeah, the indicators. Um, of how identity is built. Um, in and offline and st stored in offline networks, so uh, it has a lot to do with access. So he asks himself, what do I need to provide to get a bank account? So um, the question for it would be that uh, uh, you need to provide a, an address. You need to and provide a name. A name. You need and to a provide gender. a gender, maybe. And you need to provide uh, several things. So he just like collects this knowledge. And he has this huge database uh, now. He's doing that since 10 years. And basically what he's been able to do, at least in the British system, is, is, is able to rebuild or build new... Identities. New uh, persons, yes. Yeah. New, yeah. So he starts out... Um, well, we actually did this during the exhibition. For We tried it out for the Swiss um, context. So uh, we chose a name and we, um, in, 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 with a group of participants, um, went and got that name, an address, and a, a postal box. So we looked for an address we had access to, which had a, like a, a mailbox where we could put the name. Um, we got the name, um, a telephone number, um, a loyalty card from a supermarket. Um, and sort of, you, you sort of tried to go building up um, like trust in this identity through the documents you try to obtain. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes you need a, need a, need a valid doc or you need a document to get another document. So basically this is what the map here shows. So this is like uh, the way to go to how, how to build uh, a natural person. And uh, yeah, it was like a fun workshop for an afternoon. Uh, he was there. And uh, we always, I mean like after the workshop, we weren't quite sure, I mean like, does it really work? Is this really valid? You know, how far can we go within the system? And uh, it was kind of funny because uh, uh, the, the new identity we created, this uh, Andrea Leutenecke, after weeks, after some weeks, I think maybe a month or something, it already uh, got... Uh, she received a letter from the Swiss state uh, requesting her to pay radio and television licensing fees. fees. So it was... So that's basically the moment you know you're, you're, you're kind sort of, of wallet. It you're, into the you're living database. in databases. You, you don't have a passport or something, but there's something creating creating data in you in, 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 uh, uh, with this new name. Uh, this is a piece by. Uh, Robert Zakrowski, um, Berlin-based curator who um, works with, on a platform called Curating YouTube and we showed a series of online exhibitions he's done uh, called Curating Anonymous. So um, these are grids of videos found on YouTube um, around the anonymous identity and he is really very nice to sort of compare the various toolkits that people use to create these videos and um, the way this shared identity um, it can work. That, um, basically, it's, it's, it has like this open source thing there that, you know, there are like certain voices you need to use if you want to claim this identity, which is really interesting to see uh, with his collage. And... Um, Okay. Sorry. We um, had in the last room, we had two works. Uh, one was uh, Emily's video by Evan Franco Mattis, who are uh, Italian artists based in New York. Um, they did a video where they basically um, uh, put out a call for people to uh, volunteer to watch the worst video ever. I mean, in stating their own words. And um, this video is, shows you the reactions of the people watching this terrible video, but you never actually get to see what they saw. So it's um, this second-hand experience of um, this terrible video sourced from the darknet. 
And then we had a piece by Aaron Bartol, who's having a talk tomorrow, a Berlin-based artist, who uh, find, I think he found a zip file or an archive of, uh, of, uh, of LinkedIn passwords. LinkedIn was hacked, the social network, and they lost like 4.7 million passwords. Uh, and what Aram did, he uh, sorted them alphabetically and printed them out. So we had like uh, some books with uh, printed passwords in the exhibition. The work is called uh, Forgot Your Password. So you can sort of go and look up your password if you've <laughs> forgotten it. Aram was also there for a workshop. Uh, he uh, has a workshop, uh, he does workshops on... Um, which, which are called Kill Your Phone, where he uh, produces uh, pouches, or with the workshop participants, where he produces pou pouches for your mobile phone, so uh, you really can be invisible with, with your thing, and it really disappears, and it can't send anything out, and it can't connect uh, to the next uh, cell tower anymore. And um, we... Um, so, Medien Gruppe Bitnik produced a work for the show called The Random Darknet Chopper, uh, which you see Behind here. Behind here. And um, we, in our own research, we sort of started out um, with the question of how is trust formed in these anonymous networks? So we surfed the deep web a lot and sort of asked ourselves, how do you, I mean, how do people trust each other here where you don't know who's who and uh, where people are based and, you know. And um, we sort of thought that trust was something we could um, probably see most uh, where goods are exchanged. So we became really interested in these deep web markets. And all these questions led us then to develop the Random Darknet Chopper an automated online shopping bot which basically went shopping uh, once a week uh, for 12 weeks during the exhibition with a budget of $100 in bitcoins and just randomly chose an article from uh, the deep web market Agora and had it sent directly to the um, exhibition space. So uh, in the exhibition space, the, like those vitrines here, uh, you see here, were rating, they were basically empty and the bot uh, performed once a week and uh, it should, uh, this is the bot, uh, here is like some software output and uh, like those vitrines would be filled over the 12 weeks. Um. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so the first thing it bought was a, a Fire Brigade master key set which we thought was a really beautiful object because it promises you access to, I don't know, doors in the UK. And we and paid like 50 bucks for it, but you find the same keys on, on Amazon for $8. So... Um, Maybe ours can do yes. more. Yes, what we were really interested in is it, uh, to, uh, to, to connect those two spaces, to connect the deep web directly with the physical space of the exhibition and have like goods uh, being uh, sent around live and ha ha have the bot also performed live. Yeah, and in a sense it's also, I mean, it's sort of a mail art piece, like the delivery piece in, in the sense that you... You don't know if things will arrive. Um, there was also, I mean, for us, this uh, Wednesdays were really tense when the bot went shopping. It was always this sort of something between thrill and fear of, you know, what, what's it going to choose? How many problems is this going to cause? And, and, and all this tension, you would, if, you, if you would go to the exhibition, you would feel this tension. Yeah. And we uh, performed this uh, kind of live in the exhibition space, but we also had a, um, oh, else? we also had a blog uh, on our website, which would basically just like uh, where you could follow it from from uh, from your home, and it only showed some evidence of the bot being alive. So. Uh, it would say, hey, uh, it's Wednesday, the, f uh, the bot just bought this Fry Brigade master key set, and at the bottom there is like a small console showing you the output of the software. 
where it parses uh, the website and uh, buys something uh, which is below 100 US dollars and asks the seller to send it directly to the exhibition space. Uh, mm. Things are paid with bitcoins um, here. Yeah, no. we, we were probably, um, I don't know, yeah, well, um, we didn't try to um, stay anonymous or we, I mean, the random darknet chopper bot was called random darknet chopper and um, so it was really important to us that these sellers also had the chance of sort of, um, you know, guessing that they were part of an art piece. Um, so the next, yeah, so after a few... Oh, oh yeah, okay. sorry. No, just continue, sorry. So uh, this is the keys arriving, right? Yeah, yeah, the keys which arrived from the UK after some days and which were then put into those vitrines. Then and we had the bot bought uh, Chesterfield Blue 10 packs of cigarettes from the Ukraine. For about 40 US dollars. Um, this seller um, actually started to... It now says on his um, website that... He was, he was part of the that random darknet chopper performance. So, so the bot got quite famous, I would say. Uh, we had like a large community following it through uh, every, every Wednesday. Um, the next item was a... Uh, Louis Vuitton Trevi handbag um, for 95 US dollars. This unfortunately uh, never arrived. Um, it was out of stock. <laughs> and... Um, the bot got the money back. So, I mean, like, this was the only item which uh, didn't arrive in the end. And uh, so there is, like, a 100% delivery rate on Agora with our bot, which is kind of uh, excellent. Unexpected. Unexpected good. Well, for us. Yeah. So this trust system works. Uh, the next week, the bot bought uh, Lord of the Rings... Um, audio book collection for 99 cents. Um, we received this in PDF format, I think. Uh, this uh, was a Visa Platinum card it bought for $35. Where we received just like a digital, a digital file saying this is all the information you need to buy things uh, with the Visa card, which we put on an encrypted uh, USB key and where we throw, threw away the passphrase, so we didn't want to, you know, break more laws than we had to already had. Uh, yeah, and then then uh, the next week it bought uh, ten uh, ecstasy pills directly from uh, Germany for forty-eight dollars with very good feedbacks from. Uh, the users who already bought the ecstasy online. We got a bit worried at this point. Yes. Um, this is... How it looked like and yeah, it this came is, in after oh, yeah, a week yeah. or after 10 days. We already had it in our mailbox, you know, being inside the DVD. So maybe through an x-ray it would look like a, like a DVD yeah. case, but mm -hmm. uh, vacuum sealed, 10 ecstasy pills with a Twitter logo on it, and also, I mean, like, they were also part of the exhibition. So they, the ecstasy, I mean, like, this is when the project really got, uh, I mean, like, yeah, much attention also from mainstream media, and, uh, and it was kind of, we had, a, we spoke with a lawyer up front, and he said, I mean, like, the risk is kind of, we can calculate it, and he would say that the project is legal under the terms of freedom of art, which we have in Switzerland. But I mean, like, uh, you know, you never know. Yeah. And um, so it also bought some Nike Air Yeezy? Yeah, shoes from shoes. China, uh, which arrived really fast. High tech shoes. And uh, I mean, like you see, most of the items are like pop cultural items. Huh? So it's really, you could imagine somebody being 18 years old and, you know, go to a rave with uh, new shoes, with a little bit of ecstasy, uh, with a uh, Lord of the Rings book on his mobile phone. Yeah. Um, uh, this is, this was, um, uh, what was this called? 
uh, CAP camcorder, DV, DVR, DVR remote control. So it was uh, basically a spy cap. So, um, so a, a, like a cap equip, equipped with a camera. Um, then we got, uh, or the random darknet chopper bought um, a decoy letter, uh, which is a plain letter um, used or a service used to sort of test your mailbox. Maybe if you make a new identity to see whether stuff arrives and or you somebody can opens your get access to it. And this guy, uh, he, he wrote to us that I mean, like he, he would love to be part of the project, uh, the seller. And uh, he's fine with it, that with the exhibiting uh, exhibition of his, pa his piece. Um, then we got a stash can to stash. Uh, Maybe drugs or DXC. money. And uh, some diesel jeans and. Uh, for 90 and uh, a scan, scan of a of a Hungarian of a, passport. Which was a low quality uh, resolution, 72 DPI, nothing you could really use for physical mm. borders, but something maybe you could use for, um, for uh, online ident identification. Mm -hmm. So, um, I think the bot touched on a number of questions, but um, after it bought the XSC, I think for for a lot of the media, the main question became who, I mean, who is responsible if a code or an, an algorithm or a bot does something which is illegal? Um, can it be jailed if it commits a crime? Or is it, the per is it the person responsible who programmed it? What happens if it's open source software and there's more than one developer? I mean, like, it's our complicated uh, questions. And after the exhibition closed, uh, when we were really not um, actually thinking it would still happen, um, the Swiss public prosecutor seized the work. Um, and these global or these interesting questions became <laughs> sort of, um, or we had to negotiate them locally. So on January the 12th, the whole uh, exhibition or our part of the exhibition was uh, confiscated. Uh, we had it sealed immediately and called our lawyer and were quite worried, um, but quickly found out that uh, the public prosecution was uh, mainly after the drugs. So, I mean, like, they were like beautiful headlines. Uh, Daily, Daily Dot wrote, uh, drug, a drug buying robot arrested in Switzerland. Uh, 2015 will be remembered as the year a robot got arrested in a performance art piece. And we asked ourselves why had the public prosecutor seized the work after the exhibition closed? It sort of didn't make a lot of sense. And the media also asked the police the same question. And they said, well, you know, it's uh, the police's lack of interest in art. We just didn't know about this uh, until the last day. And so we were a bit late with our seizure. And the local newspaper wrote, our policemen art ignorance. Um, so, yeah, basically, I mean, you see sort of from the reaction of the media and also our reaction, it was actually quite funny after being a bit worrying in the first moments. Yeah, and uh, in March we got, uh, uh, basically we were asked to come by for an interrogation and... Uh, um, we went there with our, with our lawyer, and our uh, lawyer had already written a public uh, legal opinion on the random darknet chopper before. And, uh, and there it would say, I mean, like, we are in Swiss law, you, are able, you should be able to breach the law with an art piece if there is, like, a higher public interest in it. And the work has a temporary nature, like a, it could be an experiment or something and uh, that the breach of rules cannot be too severe. So basically we were, went there to find out, uh, you know, uh, if this is the point. And uh, the public prosecutor unfortunately did not want to um, arrest the bot, so it was, for him it was um, clear that he would come after us. Um, so we were um, 
under investigation for possession of drugs, um, which became a bit complicated uh, because we had never actually possessed these drugs, uh, which was quite clear from how the, the work was handled. And this sort of uh, made it sort of a, a, an exploration into new territories. So basically the, the public prosecutor uh, accused us of uh, that we that basically everybody could have stolen the drugs during in the exhibition. We said, hey, come on. I mean, like, uh, um, you really need a lot of criminal energy to go there uh, to open up this box with a drill. And uh, it would be art robbery, you know, if you would steal. Uh, these are art objects at the moment. It's, it's an art piece. You, you know, you don't do that easily. Yeah, and then um, two weeks ago, um, we received all the whole work back from the public prosecution, except for the ecstasy, which they had tested to be MDMA and they destroyed. And, yeah, we knew that in beforehand. That yeah. I mean, like there were so many yeah, good responses yeah. on the net on these those drugs that uh, we knew. I mean, like they are they are 100% MDMA. I mean, like I trust 400 users saying that uh, these drugs are okay. Yeah. Yeah. But um, the good thing was the charges uh, were dropped um, because of the overweighing public interest in the quest questions raised by the work. And so he didn't exactly say freedom of art, but yeah, it was how you could interpret the paper he wrote. So the software was innocent, we were innocent. Uh, it's an art piece, it should be okay to do something like that. On Twitter, people would make joke that uh, it's okay to buy MDMA uh, in Switzerland if you are a bot in an art project, things like that. So, uh, thank you very much and uh, thank you. see you soon. <laughs> <laughs>